Let's go for you. Great. Hopefully that's working. I welcome people to a hopefully uh, exciting and incisive interview with one of the very few people who has been an inspiration to me for the 30 years that I've been running uh, Repeat Fanzine. So without further ado, here is uh, CJ Wata. I welcome. Hello. <laughs> uh, right. Should we just go straight on with it? Um, yeah, yeah. The minute the minute you said CJ Waha well, well, and welcome, I, I got really shy. Then <laughs> well, it's a bit strange, isn't it, talking to yourself in a room back as it used to be in the pandemic? No, it's all right. I, I've done a few interviews. I've done five interviews in the last thirty-four years, so I'm an old hand at this. Well, it, it is three years since we talked last on Zoom in this sort of way, and I think a lot's happened to you in those times. That's bit, as in, there's been a Wild Hearts tour. There's been the Kicks album, the Lives album, and now the Split album coming up as well. Not to mention gallons and gallons of uh, Devil Spit Sauce have been released since we talked. <laughs> so I wanted yes. to ask you about all of those things, really. Uh, I'm trying to build in the questions that people have kindly sent in. Um, but first of all, though, more generally, um, as you get older, do you, I'm thinking about myself here, really, actually. As you get older, do you find it harder to keep motivated and keep active and keep creating? Or is it something that you're driven to do, you feel? Um, uh, I find it harder. I find it harder. Um, uh, I always, when, when I was younger, I kind of saw myself kind of at this age, you know, I turned 56 next month and, um, this is like bread and butter for me. If I don't put music out, if I, you know, occasionally I'll do some shows, then I'd have to get a, a, a day job. You know, I thought I'd be a lot more financially secure and, um, what happens is when when you're older or for me is um i have to sell a certain amount of albums or tickets whatever to to be able to call this a job and be able to make a living i never used to have those sort of worries when i was younger um and it's it feels a bit i got a lot of friends who are my age and a lot of them are thinking of retiring and stuff and they they went down the traditional route where you know i might have better stories in them but those stories don't pay for your retirement, you see. And and so it's it's a really hard one for me. You know, I juggle. Shall I carry on making music? Shall I go and work in B&Q? Yeah. That was another question I had, actually. If you were financially secure for life, would you still be driven to write and play the guitar and cook and all these things that you do that for many of us are hobbies, but they don't make a living? It's different. Uh, I'll, I'll be a professional bum. <laughs> <laughs> i'll sit in my jacuzzi and dream about making music you know because that that's a struggle <laughs> yeah. so the, the new album which i'll talk about in a bit is absolutely fantastic uh, do songs and songwriting still come easily to you or is it a struggle as you just said it's um okay i joined a band to tour all i wanted to do was be on stage tour around the world have shows entertain people you know and i love touring i love being on a tour bus i love the movement going to different towns cities countries i love i love it and i don't do that side of it anymore um you know last year i did 12 shows with my solo band you know i'm not in the wild arts anymore they stopped touring a while ago you know we couldn't get into japan anymore we couldn't get into america anymore and I if a band offered me a job, I'd join one tomorrow, a touring band, you know, if they could pay me a wage. But now I just seem to make albums and, and music. And the bit I really did not like, although I can do it, was being in the studio. <laughs> and I saw making albums as a means to get onto the road. Now I make albums because it is my, it's my bread and butter, it's my job. But uh, the end result, I love get into that end result is it's a real pain because I work on my own and it takes months and months and it's really frustrating. But when I get the finished product, it's brilliant. Yeah, it is well, brilliant. Since we last talked, you've produced three incredible albums. We'll talk about those in a bit, but I think that must be something you must be really proud of. Those three albums that have come out, uh, well, two that have come out, one that's on its way on Friday. But first, yeah, up, I, sorry. yeah. But first up, <laughs> The elephant in the room, as people have said, it is the Wild Hearts. I've had a lot of questions people have sent in about the Wild Hearts. Have you split? Have you been sacked? Uh, is the classic lineup ever coming back? I don't know what you feel comfortable saying, but if you wanted to add anything about the Wild Hearts. No, um, the classic lineup isn't coming back. Um, uh, I, I wasn't sacked. The band stopped. Um, uh, Ginger's carrying on the band with 
I believe with three people who uh, are new, they're not wild hearts. And um, so, I mean, I don't, the last message I got from Ginge was saying that he wants to keep the name of the band alive. And, um, you know, I, but I, I just, it's 34 years, you know, me and Ginger formed the band in 1989 and, you know, is, I know there's uh, some fans out there think, you know, Ginger is the band, but it's our band. We formed this band together. And, and I think there's a sound and a look to the wild hearts. And, um, I think that sound and look revolves around key elements. And some of those key elements happen to be Richie Battersby, happen to be me, happen to be Scott, sorry, happen to be Danny. And, you know, that that is, it's like a gang. So I don't know. I mean, there's no, there's no, nothing wrong with keeping a name or trying to keep that flame alight. But I mean, I think after 34 years, I mean, for me personally, I just draw a line underneath it, be dignified and, go off and everyone have solo careers or do whatever you want to do. But no, no one was sacked. And, you know, it, it, it's, it stopped again for a very good reason. But, um, you know, the last two years I've had a relatively drama free life and that's because I haven't been in a rock and roll band and I kind of, kind of like it. <laughs> so I went- At my age, I don't need that shit, you know? Yes. So I went to the Cardiff gig, which I did really enjoy, but was it the tour itself? maybe not as enjoyable as in the past possibly um there's with the wild arts there's always stuff going on behind the scenes and um there was uh, me personally i thought we had an amazing manager we had a good label the business model was finally there everyone was on wages um but uh, it's the wild hearts. It, it, the, the, it seems like whenever we're in a, a position where things are going smoothly and are being ran properly, because we've had some really dodgy individuals um, around this band and, you know, um, uh, unscrupulous, I think the word is, and um, or skullduggerous. Yeah, it's a great word. But um, we, we were in a good, good place, but... Uh, you know, I'm 56 next month. I just, I can't, I can't mess around. I've got a nine-year-old son. I just, I just can't mess around. I can't spend another three years working on something that I full, I fully know is going to implode again because it always happens. And I just can't, can't fuck around, man. You've got to grow up. You know, I don't drink anymore. I don't do drugs. I don't party. You know, at my age, I should be thinking, as I said, I should be thinking about, you know, things calming down. And so, my passion and fire goes into my music and and it's all on my terms and I never let myself down. I used to, but not anymore. Well, let's talk about your music then. Um, The first thing that came out recently was uh, Lives, which is a compilation of some of your best bits. I think it must be something you're incredibly proud of. What a great body of work for anybody to have. Is there anything on there that really stands out as a thing you're particularly proud of? I mean, that that was a... (laughs) Uh, with lives I could have gone I could have just uh, put a compilation tape together and grabbed um, like uh, performances and and just but what I did is re-recorded all the old songs and um, I feel like I gave them some some life and uh, and I also made those old songs sound like they were part of my recent solo stuff as well so the whole thing sounded like a a complete album to me but it was really nice like it's really nice to know that you can go back you know decades and there are some decent tunes there that you can you know still pick at and have a go at (laughs) there certainly are i was going to ask you why did you decide to re-record everything um I mean, I think all the re-recordings sound better than the originals myself, but that's just me. Why did you decide to re-record everything? Uh, because I feel like I'm ripping people off. There's so many like reissues, remasters, and it's just an it's an excuse to get people to buy the same thing twice. You know, I just don't believe in it. I think I think you know, if you own an album, why should you buy it again just because it's been remastered? Remastered means it's had a little bit more EQ put on it. It hasn't been re-recorded. It's just been polished. You know, it's, if someone was going to sell you a brand new window, you wouldn't expect your old window to be sold back to you because it's been polished. No. Yeah. Right? And that's what a remastered album is. And I, I just think I can't, I, I had to justify it to myself. There's nothing wrong with, you know, if you want to put an old album and remaster it and get people to buy the same songs again, you know, there's nothing wrong in that. But for me, I just, I just, I just don't agree with it. 
So you, you obviously took a lot of care designing it. There it is, hopefully, on the screen. People can see it. it's absolutely brilliant physical product, isn't it? Yes, yeah. So yeah. A lot, a lot of care and time designing that just to make it something that people would want to own, as not to, without even mentioning the songs. Yeah, you got. I mean, it's really. I mean, it's really important. Whatever you, I think, whatever you put out, you have to, especially at the level I work at, and some of my my fellow ex band members work at. We are not famous people. We're not big labels. We're selling to a very small pond of people who have loved us for a very long time, but. Yeah, these these people have stood by us for decades and you can't rip them off. You got if you give them anything that isn't, you know, 100 percent, then you're letting them down and you're also letting yourself down. So it's really important that whatever you're trying to sell it is the best you can possibly produce it has to be. Did you find it really hard to decide what to include and more importantly, what to leave out? No, I just put my favorite songs on there. I'm, I'm, I'm the record label, aren't I? So, yeah. you know, it's not like it's not like there's a board I have to go through. You know, it's it's it was um they're all my favorite songs from you know past bands and and the present. Here's a hard question that uh, someone uh, Sean Sean sent in. He said, if you could only play one of your songs that you've written ever, ever again, which one would it be? Oh, um, well, it'll be one of the new, the, the, there's a song on the on the brand new album called uh, Kick Down the Walls, which I've just, I really love it. It's It, it opens the album up and it's so anthemic and it, and it just kind of, it, it sums up what it's, what it's like to be young and be in a band and just, you know, feel like you're going to take over the world. It's a really good feeling that. And it's, it's something, you know, you can only feel when you're young. Well, my favourite as well, actually, I was going to ask you a bit more about that song later. So. Oh. Excellent. There we go. Um, how would you say your songwriting has evolved over the years? Can you tell from listening to the record that your songwriting has evolved? Um, I don't, I mean, I mean, I think I'm safe to say I'm a punk rocker, you know, and people, if, if you can listen to my solo stuff, the, the one thing that does shine through is, is how punk it is um, compared to like, you know, it's like, uh, where I, I view the, the Wild Hearts as a rock and roll, sometimes we're punk, sometimes we're metal, sometimes we're a bit glammy, you know, but um, my stuff is very punk and and I, I feel, you know, I can riff out and I can meander, but I think, I think for me, my songwriting has got, I, I kind of get to the point very quickly. I get to that chorus very quickly and, Sometimes it, it, it's quite hard to censor yourself and it takes, you know, it's, it's quite a mature approach when you cut away all the crap and just go straight for the heart. And I think that's what I do now. Excellent. Quick share of a jellies picture only to prove that 20 years ago, we put you on in Cambridge, maybe 30 years ago. Oh, <laughs> <me>. <laughs> great. That's great. Their, their yeah. songs uh, stand up. Um, Lemonade Girl is great still, isn't it? It sounds fantastic. That's a, it's a pop song. I mean, I've, I've always I've always liked songs. I've always liked a chorus as well. So, um, and, I, and I've got a massive, like, soft spot for pop music, you know, and, like, contemporary pop as well, stuff in the charts. I love, you know, I, li I like a good chorus. Um, there's a couple of questions about Honey Crack. Uh, we've got a question from Andy Johnson who says, why were Honey, Honey Crack so short-lived? on the back of such a classic first album. And Jim says, any chance of a Honeycrack reunion? Um, yeah, I think it's a crime that Honeycrack only made one proper album. Um, I think look, various things happened. Various things happened. I don't, I don't quite, I think, I think we should have carried on. Um, I'd love to do a reunion, just Willie's not up for it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's like, yeah, Honeycrack will always be one of those bands that that I, I feel was never never quite fulfilled where it where it should have gone and i, I probably i mean if it would have carried on i probably would have seen me and willie pulling further apart because he he's really into his his approach to music is a lot softer than mine whereas where i think honey crack excelled was was the fact that it was willie who has this very beatlesque approach to music where i'm a a lot more bombastic and i think that's the reason why it worked and um uh i Honeycrack could have potentially softened me a bit too much. Yeah, no one wants to. I don't want to be Paul McCartney. Uh, there you are, Bedford Squires, I think, with the red hair. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I, when when I saw the jellies, I thought speed. When I saw saw that picture, I think that's cocaine. Man. <laughs> <laughs> An expensive, expensive hair. <laughs> uh, 
how would you sum up the difference between being in a band and being solo? I know you've talked about that a little bit already, but any of the bands that you've been in, how is it different now when you're a solo artist? I, I mean, it depends. I mean, I when bands fall out, it's a horrible place to be, because especially when you're touring, because you're in such a small, you're always in close proximity. You're either on a tour bus or backstage on a stage. When you fall out, it's not a very nice place to be, but when bands get on, and when you're mates, it's you can have some of the best times of your life, you know. But um, I said something before, it's like I don't let myself down. When I work on my own, I just get the job done. I have to. Um, sometimes being in a band, it can be you're pulling, you're pushing. It's like if one person isn't pulling their weight, it pulls everyone down. And, um, you know, it's something I don't miss, you know, Um uh, I, I fortunately, fortunately enough, I have a great solo band, and they're all lovely people, and they they just they just want to play, which is really cool. Yeah. It was very noticeable on your social media posts during the tour how much you were all enjoying yourself. That was wonderful that tour. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so good to be on tour with Richie and Scott as well. I mean, they're just like um, absolutely diamond diamond people. Which moves us on to talk about the live album Kicks and also the Road movie. Why was it that you decided to document uh, the last tour? A uh, couple of reasons. Um, Alicia and Rachel, who filmed it, offered to come along and um, uh, film the, a few of the live shows and some of the hijinks on the road, and um, they didn't want paying as well. So I, I, it, just, it was just like, well, I'd be an idiot not to take them up on that offer. Yes. And um, so they came along. Um, uh, also, it, you know, whenever seeing Richie and Scott and the three of us together, I knew it would be really good. And um, all the bands all got on, and it was a really healthy tour. You know, there was there was more non-drinkers on that bus, and there were drinkers. There was no drugs. There was no arguments, no drama. It was a really healthy tour, and and um, it was one of the best tours I've ever been on. And it's really nice that I managed to capture it on a on a road, road movie. It's something it's something I'll sit down in twenty years time and look back at and have a good chuckle to. So, so there's the front cover of Road Movie. People can still download that, can't they, from your website? They can, yeah, but they'll be able to download it for as long as I I keep my store open. Yeah. So I was going to ask you what it was like touring with those those two other bands um, and how it was different from touring back in the nineties, but I think you've uh, more or less answered that. Yeah, it was it was a it was a sober tour, very clean, <laughs> and people just hanging out and having a great time. You know, really good time. So Mark S asks, is, are there any plans for those three bands to tour again, uh, depending on people's health, of course? God, I'd, I mean, I'd absolutely would love for 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 us to do a tour again. I mean, I, I you, you can never say never, you know. And and if if the stars align and the timings are all are all right, I think we'd definitely would all would all jump at going on tour again so who knows so here's here's a picture of the live album which has been out not so long have you got any favorite live albums from other people i mean do you listen to um uh, not really I, I mean i'm when i was a kid um i used to love kiss alive too like you know when i was like 11 or 12 i was just like it was like absolutely love that album and then um, the Finn Lizzy one as well. Is it Live and Dangerous? Oh, yes. I yes. so, love loved that album. But I've, I've never been a, a, a big fan of um, like live albums. You know, you know it's just not something you really... Especially, you know, when I started playing in bands and touring a lot, the last thing I wanted to hear was another <laughs> live album. You know, when I got home, I just I just kind of used to switch off, switch off from music. Yeah. So as a musician, how is it different putting out a live album in a studio? Do you go home and think, listen to the mistakes on it or the live bits, the quick crap? No, I, I mean, um, with with wizardry these days, I mean, even back in the day, I mean, live albums were, weren't always 100% live. And, and you know, if there's a horrendous mistake, you can pull it in, you can tighten it up. Yeah. You know, um, uh, it, I, I tell you, um, when I listen to Kicks, my live album, all it does is bring back really, really good memories. And and um, but I, I to be honest with you, when I make albums, I, I never listen to them. Um, you know, I've uh, I'll, I mean, once Split is out, once I get the CD and the vinyl, I'll have a listen to them. But I probably won't listen to it for about three or four years. Yeah, I just kind of 
Because you've really listened to them. listening to all the mixes and so on. I think it's just really weird listening to your own stuff, isn't it? It's like it's a bit it's a bit odd. <laughs> I, I don't know. Me. I mean, maybe maybe musicians out there listen to their own stuff and they rub their legs and <laughs> get all excited. But I just now I just think it's a bit strange. Uh, so it's on a similar theme, what was the thinking behind having fan involvement, particularly in the road movie? There's quite a lot of uh, interaction with fans, which I thought was a really really nice. Yeah. Um. Just just because um like uh, you know the Wild Arts are a very small cult band and. The fans we do have a, a very devout. Very, they really love the band, and it's really nice um, that uh, the majority of them are really lovely people as well. And and you know, I know a lot of them. I've seen them over the years, you know, and I recognise them. If I don't know their names, I definitely recognise the faces. I've seen them at the front of gigs for a long, long time, and I just thought it was really, really nice to have you know have some of those faces on there. I know a lot of the fans all know each other as well. Yeah, you know, so you, you know, do it, 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 genuine link and affection and concern for the fans. Why, why is that important to you? Uh, well, for me, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, it's just good manners, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't. I mean, when we, when we were, yeah, I, I mean, when the Wild Arts first started, we were horrible. Right, we were drugged up, arrogant assholes. Was that, <laughs> attitude, that reality? Mm -hmm. that attitude, rock and roll attitude. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain um, what's the word? Not 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 notulence. Is that the right word? Yeah. There's a way people bands kind of act, especially when they're younger, and it's it's a bit, you know, it's quite easy to get up your own ass when when you get a bit of success, you have a big record deal, you know. Um, it's just it's. I just I, I think as you get older, you, you know, you you are. Fans generally treat us really, really well. So why wouldn't you treat them equally as well back? You know, it's just it's politeness and and you know, it's like I, I like to think I've got quite good manners. Absolutely. Last question on the live side of things. I don't really understand it. That's from Dave Bowden. He says, "What London Marquee Club show do you have the best, funniest, scariest memories of?" Oh, Bocker. That's my mate, Bocker. Um, we did, we did, you know, I, I was fortunate enough that, you know, pre Wild Heart days, you know, my band, my other band would play the marquee quite a lot. So I kind of grew up in Soho and I grew up in all those clubs and they've got such a rich history. You know, it's the marquee club, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, everyone played there. And um, I mean, it's just, I had so many good times there. But we did, I mean, back in the very early days of the Wild Hearts, um, when the marquee moved from Wardour Street up onto Charing Cross Road, we we always used to go there because they'd just let us in. We could hang there. It was like our, our own little private club. And we always used to go on the roof of this place and drop acid and like, sit, and we'd be overlooking Soho on the roof of the marquee, like tripping our faces off that. Yeah, they, felt they were good days, those. <laughs> I, I, I understand the question. I didn't understand it before. Um, so Split is coming out on Friday, which is new album. It's incredible, powerful, melodic, infectious, inspiring. Do do you feel it's as good as um, anything you've done? Um, all right. Okay. Uh, there's there's something really odd about Split. Um, uh, it's I'm actually a fan of the album, which is really it's really weird. Um, when I when I was I recorded all the demos and and I actually became a it was just odd I looked at this album it's the first time I've ever made an album and I have a, it's really odd it's it's really it sounds really pretentious but when I heard it I was hearing it as a fan not as the person who's singing and and it's the only time it's ever happened and I don't know why I feel like this this connection to this album it's really really bizarre and I don't know if it's like, I really hope I'm not going the same way as my mum and dad, you know, it's the onset of something like dementia. <laughs> it's it's just, I really, there's a, I've got a real connection to this album and, and the, the the songs on there kind of chart, you know, they go like, um, Kick Down the Walls is about the very early days of the Wild Hearts. Butterfingers is about me in the 80s in Soho as a teenager. And then it has present day stuff of like, you know, being let down, being, you know, 
all the shit we went through with the Wild Hearts and everything. It's just, it, it, it's like my life is in that one album. It's like a snapshot of it. You've answered half the questions I was going to ask about, about Split in that answer, particularly about Kick Down the Walls. Brilliant guitar playing on it as well. I mean, I don't, you're not, you don't know, do you see yourself as a lead guitar player? Some great guitar playing on the whole album, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, if I can be asked, I can shred. You know, I'm not like, um, I mean, you get proper shredders out there. I, I mean, you see so many people on on like like YouTube or TikTok and they're like, oh, they're like 100 miles an hour and they don't have a song yes. between them. But they can play really, really well. But it's it's not about that. It's not about how fast you can play. Um, you you want to remember a solo like you want to remember a chorus. And it's really important that you remember guitar solo. It's not just notes spewing at you 100 miles an hour because so many guitar players play like that and you will never, ever remember one of their solos. There's no structure to it. And um, so if I am going to do a solo, I'd like I like to think it's a solo people will remember and, and they can hear my tone and the way I play. I have a distinctive sound rather than sounding like something from TikTok. 100% agree. As a promoter of young bands, I, I, I'm not impressed by people noodling away 100 miles an hour. You need to have a song, don't you? And, uh, it's um, it's it's a it's a it's a rare it's well, it's a it's a talent to have it noodling away. It's something I can't do, but I mean, there's elements of shred sometimes in my playing. But you know, my favorite guitar lead guitar player is um, Angus Young, and you know, always has a structure to his solos. There's always an, it's like a tune within a tune, you know. Yeah. How do you, this is such a brilliant album. How do you plan on promoting it? Do you use a PR company or are you doing it all yourself? Right. I was going to go down the PR route um, and then I saw how much it was going to cost. And, and you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a sole trader. I work with my manager. We run the label together. You know, I, I do most of this work myself. Um, I, I, I have a very loyal team around me, you know, a great artist. I have people who make videos for me. Um, you know, a great merch company. And, and it's like, it's all really small and played down low. And if I can save, you know, a thousand pound over there, that's a big chunk of change going towards my bills, going towards me living. Um, you know, uh, as I said the other day, you know, the wheels on my Aston Martin don't come cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to think about that. Like, I wonder if he's got an Aston Martin. He sounds like he has. Yeah, you know, but um, it, it's uh, right now. I put a post out saying that I needed some PR and I needed some people to help me push this album, and I was quite surprised the amount of people who got in contact. So I sent them all the album, and then they they all came back and said, "We want to talk to you, and we love the album." And you know, um, the handful of people who have who have heard the album have totally embraced it, and I'm like, "Whoa, this is really good." Yeah. So if anybody watching hasn't bought it yet, it's out Friday. Uh, there's another... Out digitally on Friday, yeah. It's the, the, um, it'll be on Bandcamp and it'll be on um, uh, on my store, but the CD won't be available till December and the vinyl is around about sort of January, February, because everything takes so long now. It's crazy. Friday's a good time to buy from Bandcamp, isn't it? Because it's Bandcamp Friday, I believe. It is, you know, um, yeah, but every single band's on Bandcamp Friday now, aren't they? It's crazy. It is tricky, isn't it, to know where to where to start? It's, it's a feeding good. frenzy, yeah. Your, your album's a good place to start. It is really, really fantastic. And you get... Thank you. I love it. I do love it. Um, and you get entered in the draw to win this guitar, as in, in the picture at the moment. Why did you, you decide do, yes. to, or, to raffle the guitar? Um, it's, been, it's been in my storage for, for almost two years. And um, I used it on three of my solo albums. It's, it's a baritone, so you can tune down. Right. And um, I sometimes have a guitar going, a tuned down guitar, bringing out on the big riffs, just playing along with the big riffs. And I stopped using it. And I used it on the Renaissance Man tour as well with the Wild Hearts. And I just wanted to um, like give away something that was actually, it's got some provenance to it you know it's you know this you get there's a lot of crap guitars out there and just because i use a guitar once doesn't give it a story and doesn't give me the right to want to pay someone to pay over the odds for it so i wanted to just give something which you know, it's got a bit of meat to it it's got a story to it it's been used it's been you know it's in the renaissance man uh renaissance man video 
the Wild Hearts video. It's a live video. I'm using that guitar. So, the, the, you know, there's provenance there. And, and it's it's a great, great little incentive to buy a CD or to buy the album on vinyl. You know. I think this is you playing it 2007 at a gig I promoted in Cambridge again with the Wild Yeah. 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 So it's you know uh, a lot of people are confusing it with Lucy, my my Lucille, which is a yeah. completely different beast altogether. Yeah, that that's a guitar I've had for you know well over thirty years now, and um, yeah, it, it's about six thousand pounds more expensive. <laughs> <The hang. laughs> when do people need to need to um, order by to get entered in the raffles? Oh, there? I'm gonna do I'm doing the draw on the eighth. On the eighth of December. So- 8th of December. Oh, they've got a while. Yes. So if you haven't bought... They've got a while, yeah. yeah. So, and, and if you buy the album on vinyl or CD, you're automatically um, entered into the draw. And then I will pull a name out of the hat and hope they don't live in Japan. <laughs> yes. As we're talking about guitars and so on, is it right, am I right in thinking you record the drums in a studio and you record everything else at home? Is that how you've been doing it? I, um, I record the whole album at home using um, program drums. Yep. And then I go to my producer's, Dave Draper, I go to his studio, and I get a drummer called Jason Bold, who plays for Bullet For My Valentine. He comes down, he's played on all my solo albums and replaces the drum machine parts with live drums. And then we remix the album, me and Dave. Excellent. And it's, it's fairly painless like that. Very painless, yeah, because I, I can record the majority of the album on my home home setup. So it takes me about four months to make an album on my own at home. And then it, it takes a couple of days to mix it. And Jace normally puts the drums down in about three hours. Yeah, he's so quick. Did the songs for Split come quite easily, the songwriting? Yeah, well, I, 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 had, a, um, I had to leave my flat in the summer for 11 weeks because we had a, a leak in the flat and the flat was had serious water damage so they had to lift up the floorboards and it took seven weeks for the flat to dry out and then they had to rebuild it all yeah so we were in temporary accommodation for 11 weeks and uh just i had i had five songs written and i knew i wouldn't be able to record properly for uh you know well over two months so i literally had four days to write the last six songs and i've never written six songs so quickly in, in my life. I just like literally picked up the guitar and, and they were the first songs that came to me. And I thought, right, this is going to have to be my album. And I was, I thought I was selling myself a bit short. I was just thinking, I can't write like this. And I did. And that's, that's the album. It's the quickest album I've ever written, ever written. And it's just, um, I, um, I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm a fan of it because I didn't get sick of it. There is that. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Anything to say on this um, exciting box guitar that uh, you've got? Uh, I think you used on some of the live gigs, didn't you? Oh yeah, but my my um, Devil Spit guitar. I can see I can see it in the corner now. It's brilliant. I I use it. Um, I actually use that guitar to do what my hack string I'm giving away. Yeah. Um, I use this guitar to do the same thing. Play in one note just to reinforce riffs. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant sounding guitar. Considering it's like a toy. It sounds amazing. Incredible sound. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss some of these questions out. I think we've been talking too long. Um, what's a good song? Well, either which is the first song you learned to play, if you can remember that, or what would be a good song for beginner guitarists to play? A song? I think it was like Smoke on the Water. <laughs> it's the, uh, the <laughs> easiest song in the world. <laughs> From our personal experience of teaching. It's yeah. Still- yeah. yeah. Is, is, is there anything that you know now, having been in the music business for however many years, that you wish you'd known when you started off? Um, yeah, I mean, if I could go back, um, I would have become a chef. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously, I would have. I would have. But if I could go back, I, I would not have joined a band. I would have joined a kitchen and become a chef. Yeah. So is that what inspired you to start doing the sauce? Because I was going to ask you what inspired you to do the sauce. People who don't know, you can tell us a bit about it. Yeah, yeah my, I mean, I have my own sauce, but I only sell it a couple of times a year. But no, my mum always made her own, like, hot sauce. So um, the sauces back then, you, could, you couldn't get really hot ones. So she used to buy chilies and make her own sauces. So my Devil's Spit hot sauce is based on my mum's, like um, – Family recipe, and we and yeah, we always have we always put like chili sauce on our food. Ever since I was a kid, like ten or eleven, I've been putting 
spices and making my food hot. And it's just, you know, it's a way, it's a lifestyle. It's a life there's choice. Picture, there's a picture of some that I nicked off a flicker picture by somebody called Dutch Michael. So I've had a credit. Oh, it's low. It's 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 good stuff. I mean, I'm I've got a I've got a few bottles in the old reserve um in the vault, which I'm gonna put up just before Christmas, and then I'll probably hopefully do a, another sale next year at some point. Yeah, but it's hard to get hold of. Yeah. So all these things, right. including the uh, new album, can be ordered from your website, isn't it? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. CJDevilspit.com. I'll put that up in the description underneath. There's a few more questions I'm going to rattle through quickly that have come in from other people and myself as well, if that's all right. Um, yes. Did you and your son enjoy dressing up for Halloween yesterday? Um, we did. Uh, um, that was an old picture. So that was a Halloween we spent together a couple of years ago. But he he was out trick or treating with his stepdad, and he had an amazing outfit on. But I um I like wearing makeup and masks and stuff like that. And as you can tell from my videos and stuff, so you know Halloween isn't uh, the one day of the year where I dress up like that. You know, you want to see me in the bedroom, mate. <laughs> I, I was going to say because uh, you love dressing up. Because you definitely like dressing up. I love, I love, I love, I love wearing makeup. I love makeup, um, like masks, anything, anything that makes you look, you know, a bit different. I love it. Is yeah. it all right if I share that picture of you and him just for a second? Of course, it's fine. Yeah, I don't, I'll, I'll find where it is. Uh, uh, there it is. So this is. <laughs> there we go. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. Excellent. Brilliant. Right. What else have we got? Um. Uh, 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 um. What, Jason Turner says, what is your favourite video game? Ooh, uh, I've always loved video games. I mean, um, I, I mean, I've got a massive soft spot for um, Call of Duty. Massive soft like, um, and I like shooting things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, and um, it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good release when you're, you're playing computer games. Just going, then going on the rampage. And uh, but um and I loved um there was there was a game it was a while ago called Half Life that had a, a few Half Life series I absolutely adored. Yeah. So. Another question that came in that I didn't quite understand was uh tell us about when Bill Oddie was your gaffer. That's from Marco Marx. Right. I I I for a summer I worked for the League Against Cruel Sports. Uh huh. And Bill Oddie is the president of the League Against Cruel Sports. So um. He was like technically our, our gaffer. So, but um, yeah, they do amazing things, the league. So, yes. um, it was, it was good. It was, it's always good. And, you know, it's, it's always good when you make fox hunters angry. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yes. Yes. Um, here's another, here's Chris Hunter who says, um, what's, it's quite a long question. What's going to happen to the music industry in the next 20 years that will shake it up as much as Napster did for the last 20 years? God, man. Big question. I I have no idea. I've no idea. I tell you what will happen and is going to happen is CDs are going to go the same way as vinyl. As in, you make know, a revival? Um, not make a revival. They're going to become collectible and become this thing of nostalgia. You know, like vinyl disappeared and vinyl's come back. Vinyl, or everyone's jumping on vinyl now. All the big bands. You've got like Adele getting 15,000 copies of her album on vinyl. Really? Right. You yeah. know, um, everyone, all the big artists, are, it's, it's all about vinyl because you make a lot of money on vinyl. And, and, and that's why you've got such long waiting lists now. Uh, CD sales are down by about, I think, 80, 85% around the world. I think CDs are going to come back like, like vinyl will. They won't take over the world, but they're going to have that nostalgia and... They're going to be something. A, a vinyl and CD enables me to carry on making music. If if there wasn't so many people buying hard copies out there, I'd, I'd have to stop. It's, I just wouldn't make enough. That was the question I was going to ask. Actually, I skipped over. How is your music mostly enjoyed? Is it CD, vinyl, online? How um, I have no. I mean, I, I don't sell a huge amount, but you know, the, the amount of CDs and vinyl I, I sell is enough to. It's like a stepping stone to the next album. Uh, you know, I'm a when it comes to music, it's not what it's not the format you're playing, it's what you're listening to it on. All right. You can have the best album in the world if you're listening to it on like through two pound speakers or you know skull candy earphones or something, it's gonna sound like shit. Yeah. So yeah, you I, I can plug I got a I'm looking at a pair of six hundred pound headphones in the corner there. All right. Whether I'm listening to vinyl, CD or digital, it, everything's going to sound beautiful on those headphones. 
because yeah. they, they're really well built and so you know just because it's on vinyl doesn't mean it's going to sound great i know people who, who collect vinyl they have the worst record players the worst amps the worst speakers i was like why do you spend all that money on vinyl to play it through that and amstrad you know yeah. it's mental yeah <laughs> oh. right i was going to ask you what's next for cj wildheart and then chris hunter adds to that any chance of a book no, no book. Um, if I was going to do a book, it'd be a cookbook. Um, I think the world doesn't need another musician writing another book. So they're all the same. Start out friends, yeah. you know, sign a big record deal, get a drug problem, get a drink problem, shag each other's misses it, and then that's it. Never the same again. You hate each other. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about what's next. Obviously, the album's coming out um, Friday, and then there's talk of some live dates in a bit, maybe. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm looking at hopefully doing some shows in April. Hopefully, a few festivals over the summer, and then some more shows in September. And I am looking for a decent support as well. So, if there's any bigger bands out there who need a, a good support, um, yeah, right. Send me it. Send me an email. <laughs> good luck with that because a lot of that is to do with money, isn't it? And so on. But mm. um, so the best way for people to get hold of your music is through your website that you've mentioned, right? Do you want to say the address again and I'll add it to the bottom? Yeah, it's um, cjdevilspit.com. Excellent. The final question I'm going to ask is one, of, is one I've asked for 30 years. But before I ask you, have you got anything that you've done the same all the time you've been in music that hasn't changed that you still uh, stick swear by? What, like a ritual? Or... or Oh, I don't know. I don't know. The way you tune your guitar or uh, your ritual, something <laughs> you do before you go on stage or... The way you record something, I don't know anything. I don't really know. I don't. Know. I mean, I've all, I've, I've, I've always stretched before I go on stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's useful advice. Yep, that is. Very yeah, cool. I've always, I've always done stretches and stuff, and they, and they get, I get more stretchy as I get older because I'm, I don't want to pull anything. I had a groin injury once, jumping in Japan, and and never again. So, um, uh, uh, but, but rituals have changed over the years. You know, I'll be totally honest. I used to have a ritual when I used to come off stage. I'd have two lines of Coke and a pint of Jack Daniels and Coke. Right. Yes. <laughs> Just to get me like in the mood. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. You know, you have different rituals. You know, I used to have a joint before I go on stage. Yeah. And, you know, you know now it's like, yes, yeah, stretching. That's the one thing that's carried on all through my career, stretching. So this final question I have asked, it was a stupid question, one of my kids asked uh, to start with, what's best, chips or cream buns? It's a brilliant question. Um, oof, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not into either really, but it would definitely be chips over, over a cream bun. Yeah, I'm a chocolate man myself. Oh, well, there we go. Third answer, why not chocolate as well? Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for the music. I think I speak for thousands of people saying the music you, you do inspires and keeps us sane and it's wonderful. The new album is brilliant and I can't wait for you to come out and listen to it properly. So thanks for your time. Hopefully see you live on the road at some point. And I'll put the uh, the address for the uh, your website at the bottom of the page down there. And thank you very much. I'm going to press stop the recording if I can work out how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,